Hello and good afternoon all. We have gathered in the Zoom meet with an aim of conducting a small webinar. Sania and I myself, Lesti, being the coordinators of the biography section of a college magazine, were given the task of finding individuals who are motivating and inspiring to the students whose life experiences can be great lessons, which will definitely help them in carving and shaping their future to live a fruitful life. So in the presence of our college magazine editor, Ms. Elisa Austin, and also the other members, I heartily welcome our speaker, Mr. Paul Francis Kalareckel, who is a cricketer, writer, poet, who's published Enigma to Innocent Love, which is a collection of poems, and worked as cybersecurity ICT forensics auditor, also tenured with the United Nations WFP, worked for the World Food Program Emergency Telecommunications Cluster in Sierra Leone as IT specialist and also in Sweden. He has also worked in the peace and disarmament sector and has traveled to many countries for the same purpose. Also as a project manager for various IT infrastructure projects for Afghan police and Afghan army under the US Army IDIQ contacts. And I personally do have a relation with him I am his niece and he is my mom's cousin. And right now he's looking after his mom and carrying out all our needs and being a responsible son. And he's still single. And rest of the details we'll get to know from him. Before that, I hand over to our college magazine editor, Miss Eliza Austin. Good afternoon, sir. Good, uh, afternoon, good afternoon, everyone. Everything. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, I am Elisa Austin, and I am the student editor of the College Magazine this year. And on behalf of the entire magazine committee, I welcome you to this meeting, sir. Uh, this you. year, oh, uh, this year we are actually planning to organize the uh, articles of the magazine into various sections. Uh, uh, sections such as sports, science, arts, literature. And biographies is one of the sections in our college magazine. And through the biography section, we actually plan to include articles in a question answer format by conducting interviews with personalities who are capable of providing in inspiring messages that can motivate anyone who reads it, especially the youth and especially the students of our college. And um, people who can co contribute to the society and can also motivate the youth to contribute to the society in which they live. And um, through the biography section, we actually aim to bring about a positive change in the way people think. And this is what makes the biography section different from the other sections in the magazine. And considering all the above requirements that we aim to accomplish in the biography section, we have found the perfect personality to interview and include an article in the college magazine. So once again, thanking you, sir, for joining our session. And with that, I would like to hand over the meeting back to Blessed. Thank you. So thank you, uh, Elisa. So now the session over to you, sir. Thank you. I think I'm audible now. Uh, it's a privilege that uh, the college has uh, taken the courage to uh, portray my work, my, my contribution to society, to my family. It starts with the family and then it goes to the neighbor, then to the college, university and the community where I'm living and the institutions I serve. But what I would like to say is that uh, anything you do and which brings you on top does not develop overnight. It starts with the conception. Then it, it's the childhood. Then it's the school and college. And then when you start working. So... I had a very hard, uh, hard life that is from the time of my birth till, till my uh, school, college and all those things because we were six brothers and sisters. So it was survival basically, to survive in a situation where everything was scarce and we had to grab, we had to snatch at times 
and that is what makes you tougher makes brings endurance in you brings patience in you so whatever you see today is uh, the hard work which i put in my life so i would start with my childhood uh, i started when i was in the school i started playing various games and had a profession a professional outlook towards cricket so i used to like from morning i used to coach then under dp azad basically dp azad if you know became very famous overnight when he he produced within the indian team there were five players we had kapil dev yograj ashok malhotra chetan sharma and then the next generation started coming up and all those people who were associated with dp azad uh were the ones who brought the 1983 world cup also so i had the privilege of playing with those people i had the privilege mostly playing with chetan sharma who was my age we used to travel by bus daily from uh, the place where we were living and up to the stadium so that is my association and after i uh, contributed a lot into cricket in terms of my own professional uh, uh, career in which uh, i played under 15 under 19 the college university after that i played for all india public sector that is when i was working in isro at that time we didn't have all these uh, big paying events were not there and we had to represent public sector undertaking that is the government and we were part of public sector and we used to be employed by public sector undertaking so i was in isro so i worked 16 years in isro while i was working in isro i don't say i might i might have contributed much towards whatever i am being showcased today as the person who has worked for the humanitarian cause or a civil military observer or an ict uh, ICT head for various projects in Afghanistan or in Tanzania or in Sierra Leone. So, where I started was from 2004 when I left ISRO, and that all uh, the main reason for me to leave ISRO was my father's death, and that like grieved me, and I didn't like to work any more in the organization, and I left that organization. and then i started uh, the first instance was working for america online and where we used to be monitoring chat rooms and i saw how the youth today were being misused or were being targeted by uh, pd files and all those things and we were the ones who were monitoring the chat rooms and we used to be uh, informing these to the us organizations who handled crime so that was short lived after that i was sent to tanzania where i did the ict backbone for the country and then i came back and then i in fact i had to come back whenever i came back there was incidents at home my mother fell or something happened and i my focus went towards her and each time it was like uh, my focus was always there today also i my focus is toward there because she is very serious and again in the icu so my focus in the last 20 years since my father died has been towards her so whenever i come back to india i have an incident something happens then i am not able to move back to that particular assignment which i was doing so in 2009 10 i was given the first task of going into afghanistan where my position was to monitor and evaluate about 17 universities it is it was called i was working for washington state university and it was an us id project and my my purpose of that project was to train the trainers within the organization of all these colleges but when i ever arrived there was an incidence of some cyber attacks and all those things which i could detect and which was happening from kabul university and that impacted some organizations in uk and i was like the person who had uh, uh, unearthed that particular episode and i was like 
uh, I became a blue boy for all those agencies which said, uh, okay, he's outstanding. And I, this is not basically, we don't, this is at that time it was classified today, even if I say they don't mind about it. So after that, I was like uh, put into the NATO training mission. Uh, the sole purpose of NATO training mission at that point of time was to train the Afghan police and Afghan army personnel into countering attacks against them and making sure that they were able to withstand the pressure of the Taliban and all extremist elements. So we were building bases for them. We were making the IT, uh, uh, ICT backbone for each base. So every US base as adjacent to that area was taken over by the US Army and it was developed for Afghan Army and Afghan police head, uh, Afghan bases. And we, our prime aim was first to uh, set up the bases, then second we entered, put up the ICT backbone and then we trained them and we had the help desk set up. So I did that, then we set up cell towers and gave them connectivity also. So that was what I was doing. And during that episode, there was some kidnapping issues and all those things. And they had to pull me out of those places. And in 2012, I came back and I uh, got trained by the UN in uh, Sweden and Germany. Uh, and I was uh, from that time onwards, I've been in the UN emergency roster. It is called emergency telecom cluster. Emergency telecom cluster is basically a uh, UN part which gets activated. That means if you understand UN, UN has got a cluster system. Based on that, uh, the emergency telecom cluster, which comes under FITEST, F-I-T-T-E-S, FITEST, and World Food Program, it's a segment of that particular program under which I got trained and we are the first respondents. That means the emergency telecom cluster and the logistic department, which are both under World Food Program, gets activated. And within 72 hours of any disaster across the world, we are the first ones who are airlifted and put to this place. And we establish communication, which enables all the aid agencies. That means when I spoke about cluster, cluster, UN cluster, you should go and like as you're all students, I would suggest that all of you go and learn about the cluster system within the UN and which are the organizations. You've got WHO, you've got IOM, you've got UNHRC, you've got, uh, you've got uh, uh, World Food Program, you've got uh, UN as one part, and then you've got FA. Q that is food associated to uh, food and then IOL all these organizations and UNICEF they get activated and the first respondents when they get activated and they set communication the organizations which come under UN and secondies secondies are organizations like you have got USID you have got uh, uh, you have got UKID you have got uh, Norway ID, that is NRC, DRC, MSB, all these organizations are the ones who fund the UN and make it UN. That means UN in itself does not have those funds. So these organizations from different countries pay and send roster members. So I was a roster member from Canada, that is Canadian military organization, and MSB, that is Swedish civil military organization that is uh, MSB it is called in English whereas they call it as the uh, Swedish civil contingents. So we were trained and we were roster members who gave technology to the cluster. Okay, So I was trained there and since then I have been working under the roster. So being in the IT, our roster is the widest. So it's very difficult to get a roster. So I got for Ebola response, I was there and under that response, I was on the top. I was the highest paid IT specialist in East Africa at that point of time. That is basically what I did, uh, what has given me a platform to perform one 
second is to establish myself third is to make sure that i delivered also see you can establish yourself you may reach a position but deliver it you should be able to deliver and you should be able to meet the expectation of the stakeholders the host organization the host country also if you are able to meet all these criteria then you are successful whereas when i went for the un operations i saw that there were about 60 to 70 person who came after 45 days they used to get rnr that is rest and recuperation they used to go there they used to have a high end life but the best part is out of those also you get people who work very hard who are able to deliver who are able to go to the remotest of remotest part that means you you don't even have a proper public toilet and all those things you have to walk a mile and the first prerequisite is that you should be able to lift about 40 to 50 kgs then only you are end load for this particular uh, task that means you have to walk a lot you have to hike a lot you have to take the equipments we are supposed to be taking our equipments that is the portable v set and the radio equipments and the satellite equipment so we are able to launch these things in areas which are very remote so it is a difficult task it looks good it's uh, they say that you get the highest paid and all those things but it is very difficult to sustain and to work in this situation where you do not get the basic uh, uh, things which as today if you are in kerala or if in any place which is uh, uh, which is a metropolitan city you don't get that thing if you are in africa if you are in afghanistan you are in put in pakistan and what i felt very sad was my experience when i was working for ebola response is uh, india contributes to the maximum number of medical professionals the iitns the iims and the nurses but when i went to uh, uh, west africa to do the ebola response it was sad that out of 2000 doctors i trained into communication there was not even a single and they used to like say i we don't see a single indian coming in the last 2 years for ebola response so what is happening in india is that we have got a brain drain which is into high end they are into money they they do not contribute into africa where there is such issues where you should go but when i went to tanzania the first time what i saw was indians are going there getting cashew nuts in uh, containers they are getting gold out of sirinelio and all these countries and they are coming here and saying we have got this malabar gold and all those things and we are giving food to people so that is that is something which is wrong which is happening and we try to show that these are the organizations which are doing humanitarian cause but what you don't understand is that these are the organizations who have got into africa built them up and coming here and getting all the gold and silver and the diamonds and setting up their own organizations across india and not contributing to the cause of those people from there where you're getting all those things so bad experience as i said there was not even a single doctor in sirinelio who was working who was an indian i had pakistanis i had nepalis i had burma nepal sri lanka solomon islands philippines uh, malaysia everywhere but not even a single indian and i was the only one indian who was uh, contributing to the emergency telecom cluster because uh, if you just uh, do a survey you will see in west africa indian indian airtel airtel which is there we have got 5g so what happens when we have 3g that the entire equipment is taken and launched into africa so what happens is that when uh, airtel established this in west africa when ebola came the entire staff left the country and came to india and we were the ones who set up the communication at that time and we used the airtel towers and equipments and made them serviceable that means we started making them we were able to use them so these are some hard facts which as youth you may not understand 
but you should understand that when we are trying to contribute we should start from our own self that means when indians do this brain drain is happening it is also affecting the indians who are living in our rural areas for example a doctor is trained in india an iitn is trained in indian institution and what is happening is that these people are living in india and if you go to the remotest part of each town in india you don't get a doctor proper doctor you don't get an engineer you don't get the basic facilities which the same people are giving to the rich and the uh, high class people in us or europe and all those things so when you serve your country and serve those countries where the situation is harsh bad then you become a better person you develop yourself also develop those people who are living in very adverse situations like in afghanistan today that the, whatever we did in afghanistan has been overrun overtaken everything has been destroyed but for 8 to 20 years those people if you ask the children everybody they were very happy when we were able to give them clear drinking water education to every girl Uh, let it be college university i will give you a small example which will help you understand the women in afghanistan are very good especially in studies and work also so when we had this training of the trainers at that time was the first time i understood that in this 17 universities we had about 90 teachers i trained and out of that 80 were women only and they were like extraordinary iq was very high the same thing when we did the afghan police and afghan army also when we were training the women they their percentage of pass percentage was about 85 to 90% today they may be crushed and all those things but their percentage and effectiveness and efficiency is unquestionable when we see that they perform extraordinary when they were given because the hardship was there if it's not like india that the school is established for example in afghanistan each day a, st- a student gets 2 hours to study that means there are 5 to 6 shifts that means it starts from 7 to 9 9 to 11 11 to 1 1 pm so the school works this way there are five to eight shifts in each school because the population density and the uh, teaching thing is and the institutions are totally different so that is why i say when i work in these areas it is very good uh, i like it and also it is very good. now i discussed about my work i discussed about my hardships and all those things i'll put some few minutes into my cricket career in terms of coaching that uh, i was working in a, a, a you might have heard of st columbus uh, and one of its unit is st johns it is uh, founded by the irish brothers and i was given the task of developing this school and i started uh, coaching the students and it was from under 10 to under 16 so the first group used to come who were 8 years old that means uh, we used to start the selection process in september and then they were for the next year so about 100 120 students i handled for about 4 years and after that i had to leave that uh, assignment because of my father's death so a lot of things were uh, attributes to my life and how i changed had to do with my father's death so how he was sick and all those things and today also it is attributed like to my mother's sickness and how i uh, redefined it so that is one part so cricket as such i was very successful during my time i coached uh, some of the good cricketers uh, one of them played uh, played uh, for india and ipl also gurkeeraj singh and then one of the best golfers that is aditya sindhu who is the top golfer in india uh, what happens is they they start off with playing cricket and then we had under the uh, camp australia project kps gill 
if you know the super cop of punjab i was with him and cedric destosa who was the captain of the indian hockey team we combined three of us uh, were the core members for training under the camp australia program and uh, during that program ajit sandhu was in our program in which we gave him fitness training and i used to because his father was a is officer and he said my son needs a special training so i said okay so evening from 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock i used to give him personal training in the school premises itself and within 4 uh, years he was a top india player in golf at that time so uh, there are some good times in which uh, those people whom i have trained have done very well uh, and uh, the saddest part is that uh, out of this 100 120 Ninety percent of the students who were very outstanding cricketers used to quit cricket when they reached eighth and ninth class, and I think you all the students who are in your college, if you ask them, they will go into a uh, into a place where they will say, "Okay, I want to become a cricketer." So what happens is that in our life, our goal keeps changing. and goal keep changing for a better goal so when we are in our primary school we say we need to become this but uh, we be want to become a cricketer okay after that when we reach a level and we see that we are not uh, outstanding in that particular thing then we a goal changes our goal also changes with peer uh, uh, attributes that means my friend says okay blessy is there as he says okay uh, i am doing this why don't you do that okay so our goal keeps changing each time from our primary school secondary school to college and then it keeps on changing when we are in a college and when we go for professional studies also so these things keep changing in my life also it kept on changing from being in the semiconductor industry i uh, it came down to the humanitarian cause military cause civil discipline and all those different different uh, goals were changed but goals may change but the person as such per se will not change that means the qualities that i have have never changed it's the same it's going on and i have not changed till now in terms of what i do what i deliver and what the commitments i have in life it has always been the same okay so that is something which is lacking today in our youth if you look at my poems which i started writing after my father's death uh, it kept on changing if you read from the first poem till the last poem the last poem is touching where after that i have not written it's about how the education system within india has been impacted by the EWS okay it's a word simple three word uh, education which is for every down trodden if the education system is for everybody is equal that is very good but if a student is put into a dune school or a high columbia uh, for example saint columba school where you got the richest people and this person is a very poor person so what happens when they start studying what happens so it thaws to friendship the poem which you read will make you understand how a person who has got all the qualities the good qualities is a good sportsman he is a good uh, artist all those things is destroyed because that person lives with a rich kid and the rich kid is not having all those traits so how that student de- gets destroyed is what ethos to friendship read if you read it you will understand why the ewa student should not be put in very rich institutions for example st john's the carmel convents and all those things because the student will destroy themselves and it is my personal experience it is the children whom i was sponsoring the adivasi children who were i sponsored when they were just 10 12 years old and when they reached this institution and how they changed themselves 
how they started becoming superficial how they changed lot of things it is good for everybody to be educated to have the same platform the same testing uh, standards but when we are putting a person who is uh, extremely poor in high institutions like st columbus or st johns how it impacts those children is what i was trying to emphasize here and based on that is what i have written about enigma to innocent love i think if you read that you will understand what is the ethos how the child during the various stages that is when it the child is in the uh, uh, kg the first class the second class fifth class from the fifth class onwards the child is impacted up to the puberty and that is where the base of the base and the foundation of a child is which is enhanced and how it reaches when that child reaches the secondary education and then the college so living in a superficial life that means where he or she tries to emulate what a rich kid is and those traits are getting into that where she learns or he learns cheating how to say lies how to cover up for things which he or she has not done or try to cover up facts and show things do things which are wrong so that is something which is uh, which i would say i why i wrote that poem is because of my personal experience with children there were about 10 children i trained and they were all studying in carmel convent school or, or st johns and how i felt that these children had changed completely they were very good musicians they were basketball players and they changed totally like it is 360 degree if it was normal i would say okay it's normal because these children have entered puberty but when it uh, uh, when i saw a 360 degree reverse effect that is what i said and this is happening across india in all the high end education institution where the poor children are put saying that okay you will get a quality education and it is with facts if you check that 90% of those children do not when they pass 10th they do not get admission in the 11th grade i saw this thing impacting when i went to when i go to these hospitals where my mother is treated that is potes or all these big hospitals where i see all these poor children whom i have seen in carmel convent or in st johns they are working in the lowest grade that means they are doing the cleaning job they are doing doing the cleaning job within patients giving them sponge bath cleaning the toilets that is where i felt that the same thing happened uh, during my mother's treatment i saw those children doing all those menial jobs because they did not clear the 10th grade with those marks which which gave them a entry to 11th class that means they were not able to clear those uh, grades and go to even the counseling section so that is very bad uh, i think uh, this much is enough and i would uh, there's a part in which you need to ask me questions and i will answer those questions and i think the time constraint is also there so you can ask me questions based on uh, that i will be giving you replies Uh, thank you sir for the session so we will start with the questions hello yes yeah, so so you have said that you have worked in several countries so like how is working how are the working conditions in india different from other countries like what makes india different from other countries uh the first part is the competition that means when i am competing in india i am competing with 100000 people when i am competing for a job in us un agencies again it is 1 to 100000 okay but when i am working in countries like afghanistan or pakistan or in nepal or in in africa my expertise are very high so you may not find too many people of the same grade 
uh, same qualifications, the skill sets. So in India, the skill sets are very highly defined in terms of manpower. That means the manpower that I commend, that means the skill sets that I have got in India, you may find 100 people like me within a small zone. So the competition is very high. That is why people like me, as I said, in my roster, I may get the roster positions after four or five years only. So that is the con competition which I face when I'm working in India. Then there are some parameters which we need to be very specific. That is the quality and quantity uh, preferences. When I'm working with the, the Americans or if I'm working in the Gulf, the working standards in terms of having upholding quality parameters is very, very high. Whereas when we are working in India, we may be the best, but we compromise on quality and quantity. Okay, we need to do this. We can do it this way also. So nobody will notice. So that is why you might have heard every day bridges fall, this fall, that fall. Uh, there is a uh, lot of issues. Whereas when I was working with the Europeans or when I was working in Bahrain or in Sweden, the quality parameters are very hard and fast. You need to meet all those quality parameters when you are delivering. Whereas in India, we don't have all those parameters. We say, okay, you need to uh, follow these things. And if this does not happen, you just do it that way. You have to deliver. Uh, the thing is that if it's uh, the project has to be delivered for 1 million, even if it is done in this much, no problem. But there, the professionalism in terms of uh, quality is very very high so that is what i understand is the difference but in terms of getting a job in india it's very difficult because there is a stiff competition uh, when it comes to skill set Up for that. Um, any other question? Hello, sir. Yes. Uh, I have a question. Uh, the the youth of India today they are innovative. They have talents, but they lack a guidance that is required to put this talent for a much greater purpose, like to serve a society and all. As you said, they uh, they do not know how to deliver their talent. So, how do you suggest that the youth today, um, such as deliver their talent to contribute to the society? What I understand is that uh, with the advent of mobile phones, our talents uh, we don't cross check our talents. That means we harness our talents with our mobile screen time, and we believe that what we see, what we hear on uh, uh, the social platforms, that is the right thing. I remember in 1980s, when we had the first Mandal Commission in which the students were the ones who took up the mantle, and there was one person who sparked that thing. He put on Karasin on himself in Delhi and burnt himself, okay? And it was totally students' movement and how the government was overthrown. Today, you see so many irregularities in everything, but the student community is not at all interested in coming up and protesting or even reacting. That is political things. But why the students are not able to perform is how much time they are putting on the screen. For example, I'll give you a small example of today. I was sitting in front of the ICU and there were 100 people passing in front of me, going left, right. There were patients, there were the attendants, there were the uh, staff. All of them had their mobile in my hand and I was the only person sitting and watching them going up and down. So the surveillance part, that means 
we are not capable of making ourselves secure in terms of looking at those people who are watching us one second who are passing us we are not seeing that where we are walking we are not seeing we are looking at the mobile and trying to scroll through different different social medias or for example the messages they are all official for example if the hospital staff is walking around and the doctors are walking around they are all scrolling through the mobile so what has happened is that we are spending screen time on our social media or our work everything is we have enslaved ourselves into this particular social media and our memory power has gone for example earlier when i used to have a phone i used to remember 10 to 20 numbers for example if you ask me my mother's number i don't know my uh, uh, brother's number i don't know but yes most of them know their numbers and certain numbers so what happens is that we are not proactive we are not even active we are like superficially active in a life which is going passing by and we are just walking through that uh, that particular path and not reacting when you don't react then the problem starts and that is what is the problem with the youth in india today for example everybody was looking at the launch of this moon yan and all those things chandrayaan but till today nobody has tried to see that the entire episode of 1 to 2 hours there was this cartoon thing which is coming down and going down can you imagine how is chandrayaan going to send live pictures that means if you have to take pictures of chandrayaan the the capsule there should be another chandrayaan to take that capsule picture it is not happening now the landing equipment lands and after that there is this roller which goes out that will take pictures that is the first picture so what were what was the whole world or indians doing was looking at this thing going up and down and not even understanding that this is just a animation which is being shown to us what has really happened none of us has seen it but we were all seeing it we were spending our time on that and there were so many things happening around us we did not we were not even human enough to look at those things so this is what is happening to our lives we are not looking at things which are happening actually in front of us and we are looking at things which somebody is trying to show us and we are trying to spend our time into that because we are getting free air time we are free, getting free data now i'll give you a small example uh we are having 5g facilities you go to us you go to canada you go to australia you go to new zealand you go to uk are you aware that there the the telecom is working on 3g today also so we are being fooled that we are getting 5g i'll give you a small example if you get time the youth today does not even know that what is the download speed and upload speed on his uh, in his mobile so the basic thing with uh, technology wise is that if you are getting 25 mpbs as your download your upload should be at least at least 1/4 that means 25 that means you should be at 7.5 what is happening is that we are our upload is at 0.5 so that is the basic problem we have got our tel density is very high that means on one uh, when we are getting 5g and we are getting at 1000 uh, mpbs it is being shared between 10000 people so one, what is what will be the equation it will be it will be like 1 mpbs or 1.2 or 0.5 mpbs will be the upload so education does not mean that we understood our education should be centric to what is right for us so if you go to dubai and you are living in dubai you will get 6 mb 6 gb of data 
whereas here you will get every day 2 gb 10 gb you go to uk you go to england you will get 1 gb or 2 gb or 6 gb for per month so when you reach your home you get your data so when you get free data wherever you are going so what you will do you will spend 2 gb using on things which are not supposed to be seen by you also or even observed by you so what is our youth doing today our youth is spending 90% of their time on consuming that 2 to 4 gb data every day seeing the youtube going to whatsapp watching every video so that is what is destroying that is what is misguiding our youth not to see things which are right for example if you just check you will find jio has given a uh, a reading of how much they made where how much gb was spent on the chandrayaan that means how many people watched and how much data was spent at that time and second is that when we are using our mobile we need to put on hd for example we are having this meeting if you go and click on hd that means you will take up all the bandwidth and you will not be able to communicate properly and your uh, mobile data will co- get consumed so the basic thing what i am trying to say is that we need to become human we need to look at those things which are in front of us and forget the things which are being portrayed and shown on the social media or the mobile and try to understand that this thing is not life life is beyond all these things i was looking at one of uh, the poet who was saying that uh, food will not be delivered by data so uh, it's it's in a hindi uh, it's a hindi poet who is uh, telling about the disadvantages of our data which we are doing which we are using each day uh, uh, but more than that it's uh, it's focus focus is what is lacking today in the youth today we get educated we get 99.9 all those things whereas when i we were educated uh, for example nobody could get 100% marks in political science or in sociology which i did or public administration today if you see the result you will get 100% in political sciences you will get 100% in sociology that is what is shows that the education system has been demined that means when i passed in my uh, 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 first uh, graduation i might have got 52% and the topper at that time used to get 76 or 77% whereas today we are getting this youth is getting 99.9% and all this so that shows the that we are lacking in our education system the very education system which is supposed to empower us has made us uh, made us uh, made our qualifications uh, very low in terms of our achievements we will say okay we get 99 so the other person will say i got 100% <laughs> whereas when we were friends and we were four of us sitting one person will say i got 51 the second one will say i got 54 the third one will say i got 58 or the fifth one will say i got 49% whereas today if you sit with four people they will say i got 99.1 the second one will say 99.2 the third one will say 99.8 so that education has got nothing to do with uh, your achievements in life or what skill set you develop what experience you got all those things is missing thank you sir i think we have come to an end so for the closing notes i call upon riswana am audible Yeah, yeah, you are audible, Rizwana. Thank you, sir, for making the section grant. On the behalf of our college magazine, mainly in the biography section, I extend heartily thanks to our chief guest, Sir Paul, sir, who spared time for his busy schedule to grace this occasion. And your words inspired us a lot. Thank you so much, sir, and thank you, Elisa. Uh, thank you, thank you, everybody. 
thank you elisa for make the make part of our section our college magazine editor and thank you all other coordinators blessy sania and others who asked the questions first thank you thank you rizwan so i thank once again everyone for joining and especially you sir for spending your valuable time with all of us in this so thank you so much thank you bless have a nice day uh i just spoke to my mother when she was in the icu when i went i said i have to go for this meeting and like uh, she told me that uh, in a bible when she is reading this thing there is a small flyer which uh, blessy's uh, mother had sent us uh, after the death of her sister and she told me uh, uh, that i remember her so what i am trying to say a person who is Uh, or low on sodium that means sodium if you don't if you are low in sodium you don't have proper memory also that person also remembers your sister and i would say that uh, 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 that is something which i felt very uh, very touching when my mother told that uh, her name is this and i said are how do you remember that she says every day in the bible i uh, when i am reading i see this photograph <laughs> Thank you. Thank you once again. That's so great. Thank you.